morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Botte in Washington. Today is Monday, May 1st. And here are some of the stories we are covering. Media reports say Sudan's warring parties have extended the 72-hour ceasefire. We are already in the third week since fighting has started. So uh, the uh, fighting is not as heavy as it used to be before. A former Sudanese prime minister urges the international community to push for a truce. The ICRC says its first shipment of humanitarian aid has arrived in Port Sudan, the state of the press in Africa as the world prepares to commemorate World Press Freedom Day this week. Liberian presidential candidate Joseph Boakai chooses his running mate for the 2023 elections. Just as a dream comes true, and like I said, I don't believe it, but I'm here for one simple reason. I love Liberia. And encouraging Ugandan girls to improve their skills in ICT. Those stories plus Samsung O'Malley Sports are coming up on Daybreak Africa. As fighting between Sudan's army, led by General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, and the Rapid Support Forces, led by General Mohammed Hamdan Daglo Himeti, both sides were accused of each other Sunday of violating a shaky ceasefire. Late reports Sunday said the two sides have agreed to extend the 72-hour ceasefire, which was set to expire at midnight Sunday. Meanwhile, UN Secretary General expressed concern on Sunday about the impact of a long-term conflict on the people of Sudan and the broader region. The United States says Sunday that it has helped nearly 1,000 Americans escape the conflict. Dr. Mohamed Haroun is a professor of psychology at the University of Khartoum. He tells me that the fighting appears to have slowed down on Sunday as the National Army gained control of parts of the capital, Khartoum. seems like the National Army is now in uh, control of most of the capital, which is... Uh, Formed of three cities, Khartoum, Dumban, and Khartoum North. There are some places where the uh, RSF, the Rapid uh, Support Force, is uh, holding. It looks like uh, the uh, supply lines of the RSF are cut off uh, so far because they are now also uh, looting some of uh, warehouses where there are some commodities, where there is petrol. They are also retreating to some residential areas. They are reported to be uh, breaking into uh, some uh, civilians' houses for a shelter. So this is uh, how it's like on the military side. Uh, on the other side, it seems like also normal life among civilian population is uh, slowly going back uh, to normal. Some shops are uh, being reopened. Public transport is back on most of the roads in the capital. Some government departments are back to where, like the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Interior. So this is uh, how it's right now. Dr. Haroun, you mentioned that it seems that the Sudanese army have taken control of parts of the city. We understand that there was a deployment of the Central Reserve Forces. That's part of the army. Is that what you're referring to? Central Reserve Forces is not a national army unit. It is a national police unit. The army is fighting. The uh, Central Reserve Force is uh, now among civilian populations for providing security service. So that that's uh, what it is about the Central Reserve Force. So as far as you know, the fighting has diminished in Khartoum. It is slowing down. It's not as heavy as it used to be in the last two weeks. Now we are already in the third week since fighting has started. So uh, the uh, fighting is not as heavy as it used to be before. Dr. Mohamed Haroun is a professor of psychology at the University of Khartoum. He was speaking with me from the Sudanese capital, Khartoum. Former Sudanese Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok is calling on the international community to keep pressure on the warring sides in the Sudan conflict. Hamdok says the kind of engagement that enable evacuations of foreigners could help bring a lasting peace. He spoke during the 2023 Mo Ibrahim Governance Weekend in Kenya. Victoria Amuga reports from Nairobi, Kenya. 
Answering questions from Mo Ibrahim, the founder of the Ibrahim Foundation, Hamdok said a strong unified approach by the international community would help end the military fighting in Sudan, which he terms senseless. According to the former prime minister, it is crucial to put clearly defined roles upon the military, which he says must stay away from politics. Hamdok was ousted in an October 2021 coup, and he contends the current configuration is not to be trusted. This week, UN Sudan envoy Volker Parthes called on the rival military factions to fully adhere to the agreed-upon ceasefire. He said Sudan military commander General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and the rapid support forces leader Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo appear to be closer to negotiations than they have been, although Burhan informed media he would not sit down at the same table with the leader of the rebellion. Both military factions have defended their stand. Sudan's military maintains the deployment of RSF troops in parts of the country are unlawful. In a statement Saturday, Dagalo said the RSF remains committed to a ceasefire and is working to open corridors for Sudanese residents and non-residents. Citizens complained on social media, though, that Dagalo's rapid support forces had raided their homes and stolen money, gold and other possessions. VOA could not independently confirm the claims. More than 500 people have been killed and upwards of 4,000 have been wounded, according to the United Nations, in the conflict between Sudan's military and the country's paramilitary force that is entering its third week. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. The international community of the Red Cross, the ICRC, says its first shipment of humanitarian aid has arrived in Port Sudan. Spokesperson Aliona Senegal tells me the shipment includes surgical materials to support Sudanese hospitals and volunteers from the Sudan Red Crescent Society. They have been providing medical care to people wounded in the three-week-old Sudan conflict. We have delivered surgical supplies to treat uh, wounded people because now we are talking about thousands of people who were wounded in the recent fighting. So it's approximately eight tons of surgical supplies. And now the urgent priority will be to get it from Port Sudan to the hospitals on the front lines that are treating the wounded. As far as we know, the fighting is continuing in Khartoum and other cities. So how would you be able to deliver these well-needed medical supplies to the front line? Well, getting the supplies into the country was already a huge challenge. And now, of course, getting them to the hospitals while the fighting is ongoing is going to be the next um, even more important challenge for us. So we are talking to the parties to the conflict. We're also calling on the respect of the international humanitarian law because it is also obligation to ensure that the wounded can get the treatment that they need, that the hospitals, the ambulances can operate. It is an obligation under the international humanitarian law for the warring parties to provide this vital humanitarian space. I'm sure you have people in Khartoum and the other cities. How would you describe the medical situation there after nearly almost two weeks of fighting? We had to move our team uh, from Khartoum to a safer location outside Khartoum because the fighting was relentless and taking place very close to our offices and residences. We are still trying to get in touch with some of our Sudanese colleagues because the communication lines aren't working. So the medical situation is extremely concerning. The medical system now is on the verge of collapse. And according to reports, there are almost 70% of the hospitals that are not functioning at the moment. And uh, we are talking about the time when the fighting is ongoing. And uh, we are counting the number of wounded civilians now by the thousands. And these people need urgent medical care. And also just regular civilians, they need basic medical services. And now the hospitals that are still functioning, they don't have water, electricity, they're running out of supplies. Healthcare workers in Sudan are trying to do the impossible working in such conditions. Aliona Sinako is the spokesperson for the International Committee of the Red Cross. She was speaking with us from the Kenyan capital, Nairobi.
You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Monday, May 1st. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Still to come on our program, Samson O'Malley's Post. In Liberia, former Vice President Joseph Numa Boakai of the Opposition Unity Party has chosen Senator Jeremiah Kong from the vote-rich Nimba County as his running mate for the October 10 presidential election. Thousands of supporters from all walks of life jammed the city center in downtown Monrovia on Friday for the announcement. But as Denise Nipson reports from Monrovia, it appears there is some fallout from other potential candidates. We have come to announce Rescue 2. The atmosphere was electrifying, drumming, and other sounds were heard from the far by partisans dressed in the green and white party regalia of the Unity Party. And when the moment finally came, Joseph Boyka mounted a podium and announced his new partner. My running mate is compassionate. He experienced poverty and therefore understands the plight of the average person, the young people, the millions of Nigerians struggling to survive. It is therefore my pleasure at this time to announce Senator Jeremiah Kuhn of Nima County. Former Vice President Jwaka has come under enormous pressure to name a running mate to join him in the October polls. He disclosed the characteristics he was looking for in that person. Commit to reconciling and healing our country who by their very early upbringing understand the concept with a youthful generation of our nation that are still traumatized by the war and denial, but yet is an example of success. Let me assure you, the person, I did not look for a sinless India. The offer was accepted by Senator Kuhn of the Movement for Democracy and Reconstruction, a party funded by Prince Johnson. Johnson is a former warlord and senior senator seen by man as the godfather of vote-rich Nima County, an area with nearly 500,000 people and a region where Senator Kuhn is also from. That's just a dream come true. And like I said, I don't believe it, but I'm here for one simple reason. I love Liberia, things Liberia, and I am determined to work with all Liberians so that we can make this country. You are supporting change because you cannot afford another six years of decade division. Hits and Meanwhile, the fought out continues after three of Boaka's strongest allies did not attend, namely Senator Yombli Kanga Lawrence and U.S. based talk show host Henry Coaster and political party leader Benino Yuri. One female supporter had this to say. Well, myself, I feel very bad because our first expectation was Nyomli Kaka and Joseph Nyuma Bwaka. But I would just want to tell her that where we are today, she can say accept it and decide to work with the party and decide to work with the president say come 2023. And we know that she can make it. Others say that the sudden pick of Senator Kuhn is a show win for the party because he hails from the vote which county Nima. The Nimalians are united with seeing it. Today you see people keep on Nima. Nima Kwato. They are here. The banners indicate that the people are united and they are ready for us to rescue the bureau. The process of choosing a running mate is continuing, and Liberians expect in the days or week to come, other potential candidates will make their announcements as well. Reporting for VOA's Daybreak Africa, I'm Denise Nipsin in Morovia, Liberia. World Press Freedom Day is celebrated every year on May the 3rd, that is coming Wednesday. The event was established by the United Nations to raise awareness of the importance of freedom of the 
press and to remind governments to respect and uphold the right to freedom of expression as enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. According to Reporters Without Borders 2022 report, press freedom in Africa remains a challenge despite notable improvements. Moses Javier Rimana reports. These are journalists from around the world who met in the United States under the International Leadership Exchange Program. Press freedom was among the key areas they were expected to learn from the United States and share their experience. Elaf al Hajj is from Sudan. The country ranks 151 out of 180 countries in the 2022 Reporters Without Borders Index. She says but the press freedom in her country is still far from being reached. Uh, as journalists, we've been subjected to harassment, intimidation, imprisonment for reporting on sensitive issues such as corruption, human rights, abuses, and political dissent. The transitional government has repealed some of the repressive laws, but not all. However, their effect and the laws, such as the National Security Act, still allows for censorship, detention without trial, Ahmed Nasrallah is the president of Sierra Leone Association of Journalists. He says that his country has improved despite some hiccups. The government passed the the cyber security law, uh, which basically some people thought that they have taken back the freedom that we achieved with the repeal of the criminal libel law. But um, generally, um, the country, um, everybody can practice, uh, and um, it's very easy to open a newspaper or a media house. We have, um, in terms of media pluralism, we are doing very well. Sarah Jabri is a journalist from Morocco. So the Moroccan constitution ensures press freedom as well as freedom of thoughts, opinions and expression. I'm talking here about the articles 28 and 25. So freedom of press in Morocco is actually a fact and we have more than 3,400 journalists. Uh, 1,360 among them works for the electronic media. In recent years, a wave of draconian laws criminalizing online journalism has dealt a new blow to the right to information. At the same time, the spread of rumors, propaganda, and disinformation has contributed to the undermining of journalism and access to quality information, according to the 2022 report from the Journalists Without Borders. Balen Javierimana is a Burundian journalist. He says that... Some government officials see journalists as enemies despite an improvement on press freedom in the country. Some of them take journalists as their enemy, uh, but comparing, as I said a while ago, uh, to 215, uh, there is a, a big, a big difference. Burundi is currently ranked at 107th position out of 180 countries worldwide. Under the current regime, press freedom improved slightly despite clampdown on media houses, including the Voice of America, that was banned in the country since 2018. Moses Javierimana, VOA Africa, Florida. Last week, the world commemorated International Girls in ICT Day. The event sought to encourage and inspire young girls to pursue information and communications technology, which is believed to be a tool to socioeconomic empowerment. Reporter Mugumi Davis Rakarinji has more from Kampala, Uganda, on the importance of ICT to girls in Uganda. University lecturer Immaculate Akteng typed some notes on her computer at Kampala International University in the country's capital. Akteng has been teaching ICT for the past 13 years. She says it was not easy joining the Information, Communications and Technology Department. Today I can tell you that when I stand in my class, um, I stand with confidence being a lady before I was afraid because I knew that it was a man kind of job or a man's kind of job because a number of people in the IT and computer science field were mainly men. One of her students here is Aida Chuala. Aida says sometimes she's not able to attend classes in person because she's engaged in her business selling shoes. Even if we are like in a far distance, there's video conferencing. We always have our lectures through online. And also, ICT helps me to advertise my shoes via online. They help me also to market it to various customers, both in the country and outside of the country. Acting says that is exactly why ICT is particularly important to women who most times have to multitask, like by attending to her family, including cooking and feeding her children. She says ICT helps empower women economically and can help save lives. 
You find that it has helped especially the expectant mothers to be in touch with their doctors, which was not uh, the norm in the past. You would have to take a great journey to walk up, for example, the hospital, or if you wanted to see a doctor, you'd have to walk up to there. But today, it's just a phone call away. You can pick a phone, call a doctor, address your concern, and if it's an emergency, then there's a possibility of sending an ambulance to pick up a mother as soon as possible. The theme for this year's International Girls in ICT Day is digital skills for life. The UN says with technology, taking a role in all kinds of careers, it is important that young girls are encouraged to learn and use new technologies. In Uganda, as in most developing countries, access to ICT is not without challenges, such as a lack of access to digital equipment like computers and telephones, poor networks, and cultural beliefs that technology better suits men. Experts here also say the government should take affirmative action and grant more scholarships to girls who want to study information and communication technology. And observers say it is important for Uganda, which in 2021 received $200 million in financing by the World Bank to expand high-speed and affordable internet in an effort to drive growth, innovation, and job creation. Development specialists expect it to help support underserved groups like rural people, the elderly, and women-run businesses. For VOA News, I am Mugume, Davis Ruakarinji Kampala. Uganda. This time now for Daybreak Africa Sports and here is something Omale in Abuja, Nigeria. A very good Monday morning to you, something. Good Monday morning to you too, James. We begin the sports with the CAF Under-17 Africa Cup of Nations, Algeria 2023. Three matches were played on Sunday. In the early kickoff, Senegalese defender Sujin Falou Diouf volleyed home 12 minutes to time as the West Africans won their opening game at the Under-17 Africa Cup of Nations with a 1-0 victory over Congo. At the Mohamed Hamloi Stadium in Constantine, Nigeria's Golden Eaglets labored hard to beat the junior Chipolo Polo of Zambia 1-0, while second-half goals from skipper Abdelhamid Ait Buldal and substitute Adam Hani saw Morocco beat South Africa 2-0. Only one game is scheduled for Monday when Mali play fellow West Africans Burkina Faso. In the meantime, the semi-finalists for the CAF Confederations Cup have emerged. Asek Memosas of Côte d'Ivoire secured a place in the semi-finals after a convincing 2-0 win over U.S. Monastery in the second leg of the quarterfinals at the start de Boaké on Sunday. Asek Memosa had to settle for a goalless draw in the first leg clash at the start Olympic Hamdai Agribi in raids last week. In Dar es Salaam, young Africans held on to their 2-0 first leg advantage to progress to the semi-finals despite being held to a goalless draw by River. United of Nigeria in the second leg on Sunday at the Benjamin Umpaka Stadium in Dar es Salaam. Elsewhere in South Africa, Marumo Gallant secured a place in the semi finals after a hard fought 1 0 win over Pyramids of Egypt in the second leg of the quarterfinals at the Royal Bafokan Stadium on Sunday. The first leg clash between the two sides ended 1 1 in Cairo last week. And now to basketball. The 2023 Nile Conference continued on Sunday with Petro de Luanda outclassing Cape Town Tigers 87 to 48 points. It was Cape Town's first loss of the season but second 39-point loss in the Basketball Africa League after losing 106 to 87 points to U.S. Monastery in the 2022 BAL quarterfinals. Cape Town will return to action on Tuesday to take on host Al Hakli while Petro de Luanda will take on Eslak on Wednesday. In the other game, February Viaro de Biera beat Silak 109-97 points. In athletics, Kenya dominated the 18th Istanbul Half Marathon held on Sunday in Turkey. In the women's category, Purity Komen was a surprise ladies winner after overtaking fellow Kenyan and Ray's favorite, Ruth Chipnatich, winning with a personal best time of 1 hour, 6 minutes and 30 seconds. Course record holder Chipnatich was second almost a minute behind, while Evelyn Chichir made it an all Kenyan podium finish in 1 hour, 7 minutes and 31 seconds. And that's it for this Monday's edition of Daybreak Africa Sports. I am Samson Omale in Abuja, Nigeria. It's back to you, James. In-